pre-med session today with Dr. Bob. My name is Michael and I'll be today's host. Uh, Dr. Bob is a professor and the chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF, ranked the best internal medicine department in the nation by US News and World Report. Dr. Bob coined the term hospitalist in 1996 and is considered the father of the hospitalist field, which is the fastest growing medical specialty in the United States. Dr. Bob is also the president, past president of the Society of Hospital Medicine and the past chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine. Before we begin, I have a couple of reminders. We encourage you to turn on your cameras if you're able to. This session will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. Also, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session and you can mute at that time. Feel free to write your questions in the chat at any time and we'll cover them during the Q&A. Uh, and that with all covered, Dr. Bob, feel free to take it away. Great, thank you, Michael. It's nice to see all of you and be here. Uh, uh, Tuhas and Michael asked me to speak a little bit about my career, which I will do, uh, and I'll try to do it in 20 or 25 minutes and leave plenty of time for, uh, for questions and discussions and comments. So I'm going to assume that everybody here is pre-med and, uh, um, and that, uh, you're either sure that you want to be a doctor, you're, you're, you're reasonably sure. So. I'll tell you a little bit about my journey with a particular emphasis on kind of the early stages and some of the decisions I made that worked out and probably just as importantly, some of the decisions I made that, that didn't work out, but I learned from. Uh, I mean, one key message is that uh, every successful person I know in medicine, when you ask them about their career path, they will tell you about the zigs and zags. They started off in this direction, but then met a mentor or saw an opportunity. Uh, and um, uh, very few people have a completely linear path from kind of the idea that they want to be a physician to, uh, uh, to what they ultimately end up doing. Um, my story, I, I grew up in Long Island, New York. Uh, neither of my parents went to college, so I really didn't know much about uh, even college, but certainly not much about medicine. I, the, the, the oddness of my background for in terms of my medical career was that I liked science fine. Um, I was decent at it, although I don't think great, uh, but I was really a politics junkie. I just, you know, Watergate, which happened a long, long time ago, happened on my, uh, during when I was a teenager. And the Watergate hearings uh, were on TV every day. And I watched it religiously. I just thought it was the most interesting thing in the world. And I just found politics and history and sort of as, as a, slice of sort of a broader set of questions, which is how do people organize themselves? How do societies and people make decisions? Uh, how does power work? How does money work? All those things I found really interesting. So my challenge when I went to college uh, was I had decided I wanted to be a doctor because I had a vague sense that that the profession would be interesting and fulfilling, that I'd like it and I'd be okay at it, uh, taking care of patients. But when I would go to my pre-med classes like chemistry and, and physics, certainly, and calculus and less so biology, which I liked a lot, I found myself pretty unfulfilled. And then when I go to my policy and political philosophy quest classes and history classes, I was completely jazzed. And so that led to kind of an odd disconnect in my mind about, is this going to work out? And am I just wanting to be a doctor because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a prestigious profession where, you know, and I think my parents will be proud of me if I'm a doctor and all that kind of stuff. Um, I decided, and I had no idea that there might be some way of combining this interest and maybe a little bit of skill I had in policy and the way the world works and all that with a medical career. I wasn't nearly sophisticated enough to understand that there actually might be a way of seeing a Venn diagram between those two sets of interests. Uh, so at, I went to Penn and I was um, a political science major and a biology minor. And in part because it was up until that point, this is a long time ago, um, one didn't do that. It was, you know, if you wanted to be pre-med, you had to be a major in chemistry, biology, physics. And then it, it was a, in the mid 70s and there was some emerging studies that showed that if the, the major that had the best uh, probability of getting to med school was music history. And, uh, and English was okay, and history was okay, and poli sci was okay. And once I saw that, it, I found it liberating and said, okay, I'm gonna you know, major in politics and poli sci and, um, and kind of minor in pre-med. And that's what I did. Um, and it was you know, gratifying and interesting and fulfilling, although I continue to have this lingering worry 
that, you know, am I going to fit in in med school? Am I going to fit in as a doctor with this set of interests that really gravitates more to the social sciences than to, uh, than to medicine? Uh, I got into Penn uh, med school. That's where I went and um, uh, met some mentors there who had jobs that I didn't know existed. They were academic faculty members at University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. So they saw patients part of the time, they taught part of the time, and they did research and studied not, you know, biochemistry and not genes and not gels. They studied the healthcare system. They studied the economics of the healthcare system. They studied health insurance. They studied access to care. Uh, we weren't paying a lot of attention to equity at the time, but if it was today, they'd be studying health equity and, 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 and I, it, it was sort of a light bulb moment when I said, wow, you can actually have a career where you're a doctor and an academic doctor in, a, in an environment where you get to mentor young people and teach um, and also uh, advance our knowledge. But the knowledge is not in the sort of hard sciences, it's in the social sciences. And that was really liberating for me. It was like, oh, OK, you know, this sort of part of my brain that really likes that stuff may actually there may be some use for it. Um, I decided to do internal medicine in large part because I just found that the clinical problems I found were the most interesting. I liked the people that I met the most, uh, you know, when I was on, you sort of go on these rotations and you just, you're spending a lot of time with the residents and with the faculty in these areas. And part of the decision, I think for a lot of people is just, where do you feel most comfortable? And I found that the, the way people approach problems in internal medicine, I liked the, there was a real emphasis on medical education, which I like. I like the breadth of the field. Internal medicine is, you might, if, if, if you're not in the know, you might wonder what is in, what is medicine? You know, we talk about the specialty of medicine and you, you say, I'm pre-med and I'm going into medicine. There are two different things. So internal medicine is one of the fields in the field of medicine. It's distinct from, let's say, surgery, psychiatry, OBGYN, pediatrics. Uh, but it's by far the largest field because it encompasses both general internal medicine, which includes these days primary care internal medicine, taking care of outpatients, and includes a field that I helped start called hospital medicine or hospitalists. These are internal medicine doctors who just take care of hospitalized patients. So that's what the generalists, the people who kind of like everything do. But then there's a whole bunch of people who train in internal medicine, then go on and do a subspecialty of internal medicine. And that's basically every organ system. That is cardiology, pulmonary, gastroenterology, endocrinology, rheumatology, geriatrics, um, and so on and so forth. There are a couple specialties. There are a couple of organ systems uh, that pulled out of internal medicine, became their own fields. The most prominent are neurology. So the brain kind of became its own specialty, distinct from internal medicine, as did in most places dermatology. But other than the skin and the, and the brain, pretty much internal medicine encompasses every organ that you have and what goes wrong with them. And the problem, of course, with humans is that things go wrong with all of them. And uh, so I just like the breadth of it, that it's all of those things and you can choose to do a specialty or you can choose to stay as a generalist. I stayed as a generalist. I, I did my residency in internal medicine at UCSF. Uh, then I did a fellowship at Stanford, something called a clinical scholars program, which was sort of back to my poli sci roots. It was a fellowship. And when most people do fellowships in, of, of internal medicine, they're doing cardiology or pulmonary or oncology. Mine was a very kind of specialized fellowship in health policy, health economics, epidemiology, ethics. It was sort of it was what, what, what a poli sci major becomes a doctor does when he or she grows up. Did that for a couple of years. Joined the faculty at UCSF. And my career, which now has spanned, God, 30 years, that's crazy, um, uh, has been a succession of areas that I have found really interesting and emerging and important, where my way of approaching problems and thinking about problems has turned out to be useful. So in the early part of my, and that's the research part of my career, a lot of my career has also been, it turns out I like leadership roles. I, the way I think about the big picture and the way I think about politics and policy has been useful in leading large groups of people. I like making those decisions. I like trying to inspire people. I like thinking about resource allocation. You only have so much money and so much space. What are the decisions you make to to make sure the organization and the people best succeed. I, I, I like those kinds of responsibilities. So 
uh, part of my career has been a succession of larger and larger leadership roles. The one I have now is running the Department of Medicine at UCSF. So I have about a thousand doctors in internal medicine who work in my department. And it's very gratifying and mostly most days fun. Uh, and then the kind of research and writing I've done has been what you might expect for a poli sci major becomes academic physician. It has shifted over the years, about every seven years, as it turns out, from issue to issue. So I, f I can describe this really well, and it makes it sound like I planned it, but that's actually BS. I did not plan it. What happened was the issue seemed really compelling. I thought maybe I could make a contribution. I wanted to learn more about it, and I dove deeply into the issue and often spend five to seven years thinking about it, studying it, learning about it, writing about it, speaking about it, um, and then moved on. And it wasn't that I said, my seven years are up, it's time to move on. It's just that another issue emerged that also seemed really compelling. And uh, so those issues, I can quickly tick them off in my early career. It was how AIDS patients did when they got really sick. And then it, I, it shifted pretty, you know, almost subtly to I got really interested in the role of activism in healthcare because AIDS activists, which mostly flowed out of the gay community in the beginning, were really the first group I saw where a patient group decided where they're not going to let the scientific community make decisions about them without putting a lot of input in it. And they often knew more about their disease than many doctors did. And I just found that very interesting as a model for how the system could be influenced by the patients and how important it was to pay attention to what patients are thinking and doing. So I did that for a while. Then I got very interested partly because I shifted jobs to a job where I was running the inpatient service at my hospital. I got very interested in the organization of hospital care. And actually 25 years ago, three days ago, it was August 15th, uh, uh, to, uh, 1996, I wrote an article in the New England Journal that was called The Emerging Role of Hospitalists in the American Healthcare System. If you go into medicine, you'll see that if you're on the wards, for example, the main teachers you're going to have, and it's going to be these doctors called hospitalists, and it's going to seem perfectly normal and natural, but it did not exist until 25 years ago. So the epiphany there was that the old model of inpatient care in which your primary care doctor was supposed to take care of you if you got sick and were in the hospital just simply can't work. It's too, you can't be in two places at the same time. And so I kind of made the case that a new model would emerge where a separate doctor would take care of your care in the hospital. And that if any of you got sick today and went in the hospital, chances are that your doctor would be this thing called a hospitalist. So I got very interested in that for a while. Then I got very interested in the quality and safety movements. It's a big report that came out by the National Academy of Medicine 20 years ago, articulating uh, and, and, and talking about medical mistakes in, in medicine and how frequent they are and how often we kill people because of errors. And the bottom line of that report was not only these mistakes common and sometimes deadly, but we're thinking about them all wrong. We used to think about them as screw ups by human beings and every other industry that has tried to mistake proof itself, aviation, nuclear power, others, uh, very quickly learn that the problem is not bad humans, the problem is dysfunctional systems. And if you're going to make the thing safer, whatever the thing is, you actually have to approach it as how do you make the system safer so that when humans screw up, as they will do because they're human, the system doesn't allow the error to cause terrible harm. That's not anything I was taught in medical school. It's not anything I was taught in residency. It's not a worldview that I think existed in medicine until 20 years ago. So I found that really interesting and ended up writing a book about it and doing a whole bunch of things um, to try to advance the idea of systems thinking and making care safer. I did that for about 10 years. About five years ago, medicine was beginning to undergo its own digital revolution pretty late in the game. Almost every other industry did that 20 years ago. Um, but medicine was was beginning to do it. We all bought electronic health systems and and the data were all now digital. It was something I'd been looking forward to for many years. I thought it was going to be fantastic. And I found that it was actually causing its own problems. And doctors were really pissed at their computers. And, you know, I just thought about my iPhone and how much I like it and how easy it is. And it just seemed like, why is this going on? Why are the why is the computerization of medicine so difficult? And I decided to write a book about that. And I took a year essentially off from day to day work to study it and interviewed 100 different people, leaders of electronic health record companies. I spent a day at Boeing's to see how they do cockpit computer design. Basically, everybody I could think of who could teach me something about the computerization of medicine and the computerization of other industries and what the lessons were 
and so wrote a book about that. It actually became a bestseller. It was kind of uh, it was very gratifying. It was sort of nice to be in a position of being what's sometimes talked about as a thought leader, somebody who people sort of go to to understand this revolution in medicine, because the medicine you will end up practicing will be totally transformed by artificial intelligence, for, by AI, by, uh, by telemedicine, by home sensors, and it will look almost nothing like the medicine I learned to practice, where the only way we could take care of a patient was they came into the office for an office visit, all of the data we collected, we collected when they, <clears throat> when they came to see us. Uh, patients had no access to information, so they were completely dependent on their physician to be the oracle. None of that's going to be true for your careers. And so I just find that transition really interesting, really important, pretty bumpy. And so I've spent a lot of time writing about it. And then for the last year and a half, I, it's been all COVID all the time. Um, when COVID broke, uh, I found myself in a funny position. I run the biggest department at a, one of the major medical centers in the, in the country, and yet I had almost nothing to do. And the reason was every big hospital immediately transitioned to a healthcare version of martial law, where all of the usual processes for making decisions were, were stripped away. The only thing we were thinking about was how to, de how to deal with COVID and deal with the, the first surge. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm chair of a major department, so I was on, you know, day to, you know, morning to night Zoom calls, hearing about information, learning about new research, just taking it in and processing it and having almost nothing to do with it. And I just, I would already been on Twitter and, you know, maybe had 15,000 followers and kind of liked it and liked the form, learned a lot from it. And I just decided to start tweeting about COVID and what I was seeing and, I'm not, you know, I'm not the, an expert on any of the things that you would need to be an expert in COVID, but I know a little bit about all of them. And a lot of the experts, it's true in general about medicine. You know, one of the questions you'll have in medicine is, do you, do you, do you become a generalist or a specialist? I really like being a generalist. I like being the person who knows a little bit about a lot of things and synthesizes it and is the quarterback, but is always needing to learn. You know, when I take care of a patient, I need to call the cardiologist. I need to call the rheumatologist, I need to call the surgeon, or I need to look things up. I like that. It's not everybody does. And for COVID, I found the same thing, that I know enough about infectious disease and virology and immunology and vaccines and politics and policy and, you know, epi to understand sort of the data and the research. I know who to talk to to understand more and who to follow on Twitter. So I just started sort of pulling it together and synthesizing what I was seeing and what the emerging trends were and what I thought the big issues were. And also doing something, you know, telling people I'm scared too, you know, that this is terrible and I'm worried I'm gonna die and my family's gonna get it and all that. And also telling people, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm thinking, you know, I will do this and I won't do that. And lo and behold, like, you know, my followers went from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 up to now 190,000. Um, when I tweet now, I get calls from the New York Times wanting to talk about my tweets. I get calls like all the time from my local San Francisco newspapers and, and news stations who are like follow my Twitter like they're following a baseball you know, team. It's just it's a little bizarre. I'm I'm it's been gratifying in a way. And uh, also, I'm more than happy to be done with it. And I was hoping two months ago that I'd be done with it and that this we'd be looking back on COVID and clearly that's not true. So it's sort of sucked me back in. And now I spend probably two or three hours a day on media. Um, and, you know, yeah, it takes me a little bit away from my day job, but I actually feel like it's the most important thing I can be doing now. You know, the it, it is, it, this remains incredibly interesting and evolving and confusing and people, there's no issue in the world that people need to know more about and want to know more about. So um, I've been trying to sort of figure out ways of communicating uh, both to the scientific community, because a lot of, you know, I, I'm privileged to be able to sort of hear things from experts that, you know, the average doctor may not, but also communicate to the lay public who just are massively confused about what's going on. So that's been, that's been pretty gratifying. Um, let me, so in terms of kind of my day job of, of running a department and then kind of what I do clinically, clinically, I take care of hospital patients, always with residents and medical students. So we're part of a ward team. And I do that for about a month a year uh, in three 10-day blocks. 
that is calibrated to be any less than that, I'd get really stupid really quickly. Any more than that, I couldn't do the rest of my job. So that's that's sort of you know very precisely calibrated. Um, I love doing it, but I would not want to be a full time doctor. I love the variety in my job, the fact that every single day. I might be taking care of patients, I might be teaching a medical student, I might be writing a paper, I might be giving a talk, I might be consulting with a with Google or a tech company. Uh, just the variety is just fantastic. And 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 I just went to a med school reunion a couple of years ago. So my col I'm 30, I'm 63 and most of my colleagues are that age. The ones who've been in private practice have generally enjoyed their career and have had, you know, been great and had satisfying careers, but they're all looking to retire because they've been doing the same job for 30 years. And I feel like I have this incredible job where I do, I have a different job every day and it sometimes evolves because I decide I want to sort of focus on a different thing. So that's what I do clinically. Administratively, I run a big business. I run a department that has 900 faculty and 3000 people and has a yearly budget of $600 million. And it in many ways is a, it's a funny business because we have three product lines that I'm trying to balance. We need to figure out how to deliver really good, safe, satisfying, high quality, care and work very closely with the health system to do that. We need to figure out ways of training and have great training programs for students and residents and fellows. And we need to do cutting edge research and research. I've got researchers who are like the world's best CRISPR people. And I have researchers who are studying homelessness uh, or studying uh, how do we do better healthcare in prisons and everything in between. And, uh, and so my job is to figure out ways of making that work which is mostly how do we create an environment where great academic faculty members want to work with us and want to stay and tell their friends this is a great place to work. And my job is to sort of make all that work out. So at that scale, you spend a lot of time delegating. You spend a lot of time you know, doing things that are visible for the entire 3,000 people. Uh, but a lot of my management is through division chiefs, so through the chief of cardiology, the chief of GI, or through associate chairs for education or research. And um, uh, there's just no way to manage anything that big where you are doing everything. You've got to figure out ways of, of, uh, uh, of, of delegating and building teams that are highly functional. And I'm very proud of that. The people I work with are, are amazing. So... Um, so I think Sue has asked, how do I describe my day-to-day -day life? There is no one model for it. Um, you know, these days, so much of it is remote and we're still mostly, you know, I'm in the hospital when I'm taking care of patients. When I'm not, I can be anywhere. I'm actually in New Hampshire now. Um, and uh, so today I had a couple of hours that were with the media. I just got off a Zoom call with uh, the researchers in our department, the, uh, explaining to them how the promotion process worked. Um, I consulted for a bunch of venture capitalists that are trying to understand the shape of COVID and what's going to happen over the next six months. Um, uh, I interviewed a prospective faculty member for UCSF. And, you know, that's not, uh, that's sort of a typical day. There's no, not, not any one typical day. It varies. The, the times that, that month of year when I'm on clinical service, basically from 7.30 in the morning till about three in the afternoon, that's all I'm doing and might have a couple of meetings in the afternoon. I get a couple of hundred emails a day. I've got to somehow try not to fall behind, which is hard. So interspersed in the day, I've got to find a couple of hours to kind of keep up with my email traffic. Uh, I'm spend probably 45 minutes or an hour a day on Twitter, um, either tweeting or reading what's new and interesting from people who I want to hear what they're thinking about. And particularly with COVID, because, you know, I think I spoke to the New York Times and NPR today, and they're asking me questions about what do you think about X or Y? I need to be really updated about what Biden said this morning. So um, I have to spend probably an hour a day on just sort of keeping up to date on, on COVID related things. Hopefully that will, <clears throat> that will go away over time. But it's incredibly interesting and really diverse, and I really like that. There's no no one day, and I'd say the average work day is pr I probably work 55 to 60 hours a week, and for somebody that wants to work 40 hours a week, it's not the right job. It's just there's just too many moving parts, and I'm pretty efficient. I don't dawdle. I don't emails don't sit. They I answer them quickly and move on. But um, I don't see you couldn't be successful doing it 40 hours a week. So if you want a 40 hour week job, which is perfectly reasonable thing to want, then you probably wouldn't want a job like mine. 
So that, let me stop and uh, do you want me to read questions or do you want to, how, how do you guys like to do it? Usually we read them out to you and you can yeah, give sure. a response from there. All right, so the first question we have is, what are some of the interesting cases you've seen so far? And we say cases, do, do you mean clinical cases? Yeah, clinical cases, patient cases. Oh, I mean, every time I'm on the wards, there is something, I mean, in the first day, there's something incredibly interesting. You know, it's, it, it's funny because I've reached a stage of my career where the most interesting things are the complicated ethical problems. They are um, the patient who is bleeding out from a gastrointestinal bleed, but is a Jehovah's Witness and won't accept a transfusion. They are, um, it's clear to me and to us that further care for someone is futile, but the family doesn't believe that, or for a variety of sort of cultural reasons, they don't want the patient to know about what's going on. They want to know what's going on. And sort of balancing and managing all of those things is just, I find, really, really challenging, really interesting, uh, and, and, and immensely hard. Um, you know, I was on, just on the wards last month, and uh, we had a run on hepatobiliary disease. So we had several, and it just sort of random, it just happens. Every, one of the things that, that's nice about general internal medicine, uh, which is really what I practice in the hospital, is one patient comes in and they're septic, they've got a bloodstream infection and they have no blood pressure and we have to resuscitate them. And the next person comes in and is having a major gastrointestinal bleed and sometimes from an ulcer and sometimes from a cancer. And the next person comes in and they're, they have metastatic cancer that's now spread to their back and is compressing their spinal cord and they can't walk. And the next person comes in and is having a flare of their rheumatoid arthritis. And the next person comes in and has COVID. Um, it's sort of all of that. And so the variety is just incredible. And again, I like the idea as a generalist, um, every patient who comes in, the person with a GI bleed, the person with a heart attack, the person with a stroke, the person with sepsis, I can name for you five people in the building right now who know more about that particular problem than I do, but I know more about all of it than they do. And that mixture, I think, is wonderful. It means that I'm constantly, you know, talking to them and, and, and with my team. You know, one of the things we do is like we track down, you know, we say for this problem, we really need to speak to the rheumatologist to kind of deeply understand whether this could be a form of lupus or not. And so we corner the rheumatologist or we go down to radiology and look at the x-rays with the specialist. And we say, here's what we're thinking. Here's the questions we have. And then you get this person who's a world expert in that, that narrower niche to explain it to you. And then our job is to sort of put it together and come up with a plan and explain it to the patient, the family. So I just find that immensely gratifying. Wow. Also, another question we have is, in what ways, you mentioned a little about the kind of computerization of medicine, right? So in what ways do the computerization of medicine, or at least the you know future involvement of AI, um, or how would you predict that to change the day-to-day -day job in, of a doctor if it hasn't already really made an influence as much now? Yeah, I mean, computerization has changed everything now, but we haven't seen anything yet. So that's a sort of self-contradictory answer. But what I mean by that is 10 years, well, let's say 20 years ago, um, I saw a patient. I wrote down my note on scribbled on a piece of paper that went into a chart that lived on in a in a in a binder in a nursing station in the hospital. Um, their laboratory results were computerized then, but their x-rays were a single copy of an x-ray. I had to go to the x-ray department and look at this x-ray that I hung up on a light board so I could actually see it. When I was prescribing a medicine, I would write it on a prescription pad. If I happened to forget that the patient was allergic to something, there was no mechanism to block me from writing that prescription. Hopefully somebody would catch it along the line, but not, not always. So um, when I communicated with my colleagues, it was via a telephone call or a, mostly a beeper. You know, now doctors are the only ones still have beepers. Even the drug dealers don't have beepers anymore. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the, you communicated by, by sending them a page and then they would call you back. That was how we communicated. 
Um, the chart, as I said, lived in only one place. Patients had no access to any information. And when I needed to look something up, I went to this thing called a library and I went to something called Index Medicus and I would go look up, you know, complications of lupus and they would send me to the stacks and I'd pull out a journal and look at that. So that was the practice of medicine. So it has been utterly transformed. There's no, really, there's very little paper. Uh, when I'm writing a note, I'm writing it, typing it in a computer or dictating in a computer. Uh, because of that, it's available immediately to anybody else who wants to see it, the patient's primary care doctor. Uh, starting last year, that includes the patient, so the patient can read all of our notes. That was not true until very recently. Uh, the x-ray doesn't live as a single x-ray in the radiology department. It lives as a computerized image, so anybody can see it. When I write a prescription, it's electronic, and it goes automatically to Walgreens uh, or CVS. So that's all terrific. Uh, when I wrote my book, it was partly because you might say, like, why are doctors so unhappy with their computers? Well, if you go to see a doctor these days, you're probably going to notice that you're talking to the doctor, but the doctor has got his or her head down typing away because now they have to spend an enormous amount of time documenting stuff in the computer. And the data says that physicians have spent at least half of their day on the computer. Now, you might say, you know, OK, that's fine, except a huge amount of that time is spent putting stuff into the computer and the amount of useful intelligence that we get out of the computer is shockingly small. And I liken it sometimes to if you had, if you, you know, you had a baby and you spent all this time feeding and changing the baby and the baby never smiled at you, you'd be pretty pissed at the baby. And that's the way it is with computer. We're spending an immense amount of time putting stuff in. And the, and you might ask, why are we putting more, more time putting stuff in than we did when we were scribbling? And the answer is once there were computers, then the system could make us document certain things that are in the system's interest. So the bill that I send off to Medicare or Aetna pays me and the hospital better if I document a certain number of things. So if I don't document a certain number of things, the computer is going to ping me and say, it looks like you only documented six things, but if you document three more, you're going to get paid a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Our hospital is judged on its quality, and the quality is judged by the computer basically looking at my notes and seeing how sick the patients were because that's to adjust for that when it looks at how often they lived or died be like the diving contest where you know in the olympics where you choose a higher degree of difficulty uh, to get more points and so the computer including the system i and every doctor works in now pushes you to make sure that you're documenting the things that will make the patient appear as sick as possible so that the outcomes look better once they're adjusted for for sickness so there's a whole bunch of things that the computer has facilitated that are more kind of annoying and on more on the grounds of kind of helping the system get paid better or look better than really are meaningfully helpful in patient care. What would be really helpful in patient care? If while I was documenting the patient's history, the computer would say, it sounds like, you know, patients like this turned out to have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or colon cancer. And how does it know it through AI that says that, you know, when doctors wrote down this, 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 or laboratory studies showed ABC, or the physical exam showed ABC, that we know from having sifted through a million records that those patients tended to have these diseases. I know that technology exists because Netflix knows how to do that. It says customers who like this movie also like that movie. Amazon certainly knows how to do that with books. So why don't we have that kind of decision support um, in the intensive care unit, we have computers all over the place. The computers fire an alert when a patient's vital signs or the other parameters the computer is picking up violate whatever the boundaries are. So that's things like oxygen level, blood higher low blood pressure, heart rate, EKG tracing. So you might say, well, that's great. You know, that's what we want our computers to do, to be able to alert the nurse or doctor if the patient isn't doing well. That's partly why we like computers and they're better than humans. Well, the problem is that a colleague of mine who's a nurse researcher a few years did a study where she looked at our 70 ICU beds at UCSF and looked at how often the computers that monitor those vital signs sent off an alarm. And the answer was in a month, 2.5 million alarms were, 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 were set off. 
uh, one about every five or six minutes. Why? Because anytime a patient's heart rate goes a little higher, a little low, the alarm goes off. So I remember talking to a, a nurse once and the alarms are going off every two seconds. And the nurse seemed kind of completely mellow about it. And I said, like, what would make you really worried about your patient? And she said, silence. She said, if there were no alarms, I'd be really worried, which is like the world's upside down. The alarms are there to tell you that something's wrong, not the alarms are telling you something's right, the patient's alive. So what would a better system look? It was a better system would have a level of artificial intelligence that knows what I know because 99.5% of those alarms, they go off and I hit the snooze button because I know it's meaningless. It's a false alarm. If I can do it, a computer could theoretically do it, but it does not do that today. So in the world, as these computers get more sophisticated and the data get more sophisticated, then the computers will provide us much more, and patients as well, much more meaningful decision support that helps understand this patient, their set of problems, matches it to the literature, what the, what the science says you should do for patients like that, and also matches it to huge databases of patients that say patients like this did better with treatment A or B or tended to have diseases C, D, and E. Uh, the computers that we have now do virtually none of that. I know what this looks like because my son, my older son, uh, is in a profession that has figured all this out. He works in Major League Baseball. And his, his, you know, they take in a huge amount of data on every interaction, interaction being a pitch and a hit and a throw and all that kind of stuff. And he can tell you that this guy can't hit a low and outside curveball on Tuesday nights when the wind is out of the Southwest and uh, the pitcher is over six foot two. And I can't do any of that in medicine, although arguably you would think what I do is just as important as what he does. But many other fields have taken the data that they have from their computers and put the money in and invested in the people and the money and the systems to take that data and analyze it deeply to get smarter about how to do the thing they're doing better. And certainly retail has done that and travel has done that and and sports have done that and medicine is just at the training wheel stage of that and that'll be a pretty exciting part of your career because we're gonna you know clearly that's going to happen but it has not really started happening yet thank you so much for your thorough answer i'm sure that answers a lot of questions um in fact we had another question and i think you covered that one too uh but going back to college thinking back to college what were some of the struggles you faced and how did you persevere through them um, well, I won't get into my social life. Um, so what were the struggles I faced during college? I'd say the main cognitive struggle was the one I told you about already, which was sort of the, the stuff I really loved, the classes I really loved were not what I was, was, was not what I was supposed to be taking to do the career I thought I wanted to do. And that, that turned out to be, uh, to be okay. Um, I had a pretty benign, you know, I had a odd, my senior year in college, I was actually my college's school mascot. That was not a struggle. It was, but it was a weird way of spending one's time. And it was, I'm the answer to a trivia question. If anybody's a college basketball fan, the question is who was the mascot of the last Ivy League team to go to the final four in basketball? And the answer is me. So the last Ivy League team that went to the final four is the Penn Quakers in 1979, not remembered because we lost by like 97 points. Uh, because we played this team that had a guy named Magic Johnson on it, and uh, he was pretty good. And uh, so that Final Four is best known for Magic Johnson playing Larry Bird, sort of the two preeminent players of, of my generation. Um, I'd say most of the challenges I had were not scholastic. They were, they were social. They were fitting in. They were meeting women. They were all, all the stuff that, you know, college is hard for. But I, I did okay. Um, and uh, you know, he found it easier to do well in the science and the stuff I loved, which was poly design history. A little harder to do okay in uh, in the sciences. Although getting into med school was easier then than it is than it is. Now. I know that I have a daughter who's a fourth year med student, so I sort of seen what it looks like um, now. And I think it's you know it's it's it, it was hard then, but it's become sort of one degree harder than it was uh, than it was back then. I think we paid very little attention the 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 kind of social consciousness that I guessing all of you have was really not on our radar screen at the time. I'm sort of ashamed about that because it should have been, but it was sort of the, the dominant culture. Uh, didn't think about issues of equity very much. Didn't think of uh, certainly climate change was not an issue. Sort of the, my sense is, you know, college kids today 
are much more plugged into, I mean, I was very interested in politics, but much more plugged into sort of the state of the, the universe and the state of humanity, and obviously much more diverse than, than, than we were. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I'd say academically, it, you know, it went pretty, uh, you know, I did, I did okay. Uh, I remember like flunking a chemistry test at one point and thinking it was the end of my end of the world. And, you know, met with my TA, I think, who said, you're doing fine otherwise, and don't worry about it. And I did, I, you know, I brushed myself off and did okay. I think everybody at some point has a near death academic experience. And I had a couple, but nothing too terrible. And I, I enjoyed college a lot. Sounds good. As a physician interested in policy, like you mentioned earlier, um, that kind of carried on to your leadership skills later on as a physician. Could you share a bit about the impact of Obamacare on the practice of medicine? Did it increase focus on preventative care and, and related um, significant topics like that? Yeah, I think Obamacare is, uh, people overrate its impact on the day-to-day -day practice of medicine. The, what Obamacare did that was really crucial and, and you know, it was a, a massive advance was just figure out a way that was politically feasible to get 20 or 30 million people insured that had no health insurance. So that is, you know, that is an accomplishment enough in a way. Uh, it did not get us to universal health care insurance, but I think given the art of the possible uh, and the politics at the time, it was as far as could be meaningfully or reasonably expected uh, an, an administration could do in terms of moving toward, uh, toward universal, universal care universal insurance. And so, you know, it saved tens of thousands of lives and without question of people who previously had no access to preventive care. If you had no health insurance, you were not going to see a primary care doctor, maybe unless you're in certain cities that had clinics that were set up for the uninsured. But by and large, you had really no access to prevention, no access to medications, and tens of millions of people and families now do. And so that is a towering achievement that should not be at all minimized. On the other hand, the crafters of Obamacare, and I know many of them, uh, really intended that it would also transform the practice of medicine and move us from the dominant fee-for-service system, which is the way medical payment has been organized. You know, a patient goes in the hospital, the hospital gets paid for a hospitalization, patient sees a doctor, doctor gets paid for a visit, to a system that would be more what's sometimes called value-based, meaning that rather than paying for each thing, which of course creates an incentive to do more things, more visits, more cardiac catheterizations, more CAT scans, more everything, we should move to a system that provides the, a healthcare system a fixed payment for a patient to get the care that they need, either for an episode, like you're having your hip replaced, we'll pay you $52,000, uh, or for everything that we're going to pay for all of the care that a person might need and figure out how to do that, to risk adjust that, because this is the, the part of the reason I talked about all this extra documentation. You can't just pay a health system X amount of money to take care of a patient because the cost of taking care of an 80 year old versus a 30 year old are vary by, you know, 50 fold. And so, and the cost of taking care of a sick 60-year-old is very different than taking care of a healthy 60-year-old. So you have to figure out how to risk adjust the payments so that they're appropriate. The problem with capitated payments is fee-for-service payment is definitely an incentive for systems to do more, and it's partly why the, the reason healthcare is so damn expensive. Um, if you flip the incentives and say to healthcare systems, we're just going to give you a fixed amount of payment to take, to take, take care of a person for a year, you've created a pretty powerful incentive to do less. So you have to build into that something that prevents that the system from getting ahead by doing less. And the counterbalance is a set of measures that are something called value-based payment, where it's not just volume and it's not just uh, uh, incentive to do less, but we're also going to measure the quality of the care you deliver. Not only ask patients whether they're satisfied, but see, did you do preventive care? Did you do the right thing? You know, we, and we've been trying to tweak that model for the last 50 years, trying to find out the right way of providing the appropriate incentive not to skimp on care, but not to give too much care. Obamacare was partly designed to try to move us to a more value-based payment model. 
and it's had partial success, but not complete success. Most doctors and most hospitals still mostly get paid to do more stuff. And they're mostly ethical, and it's not like they're doing completely unnecessary procedures or x-rays or things like that. But there are a whole lot of decisions in medicine that are really uncertain. It's not clear what the right thing to do is. And if your incentive is to focus on prevention and to do less stuff, you will. And if your incentive is to do more stuff, then it's just easier to do more stuff. So I don't think it it really turbocharged the set of incentives that we need to really focus on prevention. That incentive is really capitation. If you say to a health system, we're going to give you a certain amount of money to take care of Michael Bullis on January 1st, and you're going to be in my system for 10 years, which is really important. If I think you're only be with me for a year, then I'm still not all that incentivized to do prevention because a lot of prevention doesn't pay off for 10 years if I'm treating your high blood pressure, your diabetes. But if, if you have a combination of a fixed payment, a measurement of quality and of your satisfaction and a long enough time horizon, then you've created a, a, a system that really should focus on prevention, not just on acute care. The American healthcare system is very much geared toward taking care of people when they're desperately ill. We're fantastically good at doing transplants, at providing chemotherapy, at doing, you know, taking care of people when they're really sick when they come to the hospital. But that's not the right way to do it. The right way is a much more balanced system that's focused partly and much more than we do on prevention in the first place. Obamacare moved us a little, moved the needle in that direction a little bit, but not as strongly as it needed to. One of the key things that happened, not in Obamacare, but about the same time, was the federal government did put $30 billion into computerizing the healthcare system. And that's why pretty much every hospital and every doctor's office now has an electronic health record because the the federal government incentivized that. I think that was a really important step. But to get to the next level of digitization and digital transformation is not going to be these big systems that we all bought. It's going to be a much more complex and diverse set of electronic tools, much of which are going to be not your electronic health record, but are going to be built by small startups that are building cool tools the way, you know, the way the rest of your life works. Thank you for another thorough answer. Uh, kind of just to branch off of that, I was just wondering, what are some, like you discussed specifically with policy regarding Obamacare, uh, what are some pros and cons behind it? But specifically with internal medicine, I know that it's still a general field, uh, but specifically within the field, within so far the research advances that I'm sure that you're uh, well versed in and well involved in, what are some challenges you see in this day and age and how do you think that they'll be solved in the future moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I can go a lot of directions with that. I'd say one of the great challenges of general internal medicine is it's, it's, if you have a primary care doctor, you probably know this, your primary care doctor has a really hard job because people, you know, most of the people that we see are older, sicker, have multiple diseases, probably would have died much younger 30 years ago, but now they're alive. They're, they're 80 years old. They've got five diseases. They're on 14 medications. And now because of computerizations and, and patient portal, they now kind of expect to have 24 seven access to their doctor and sending emails and messages. And we've got no kind of way to manage that. And it's gonna get worse. Think about now when they're, they now have a digital scale and a digital glucose meter and a digital toilet and all of that data now they, is gonna stream into the healthcare system. Somehow we're gonna to have to manage that. I mean, I have no idea how that's gonna work. So. I think the great challenge of internal medicine is to sort of figure out how to make the job of primary care uh, doable in an environment where a lot of the forces make it just harder and harder to do. Um, you know, the advances are real. We're much better at the mortality rates for heart attacks are half of what they were. Strokes are less than half of what they were. Cancer, which, you know, really didn't budge for many years. Mortality rates have gone down significantly. We really have some tremendous ways of treating a lot of the major problems that people have, but we're still not as good as we should be in treating diabetes and treating high blood pressure, getting people to stop smoking. Those are the things that have the major impact on healthcare. And again, part of that is the payment system, that the incentive for us to be really good at taking care of a heart attack is pretty good. The incentive for us to invest in, in making sure a patient with diabetes doesn't, you know, takes care of their feet really well so they don't lose their feet to gangrene or, or manage their sugar really carefully are not as powerful, and that is part of the problem. I think there'll be a revolution in genomics, but people have been predicting that for 20 years. And in my day-to-day -day practice, 
it, it virtually never comes up. It's become an issue in oncology uh, where where you know if you have a cancer we really do think about your cancer and how to treat you in a different way based on the genetic profile of your cancer uh, and so we're, this is the field called precision medicine the idea that we're not just going to have a chemotherapy for lung cancer we're not just going to have a treatment for high blood pressure but the treatment will actually be tailored to the particular your gene profile the gene profile of the tumor and we're going to know that this treatment works better for someone with this genetic signature for a blood pressure, and this other treatment works better for a different person. That's been the promise for about 20 years. I think it actually will revolutionize medicine in, in your clinical lifetimes, but it has been pretty slow in coming and really doesn't influence day-to-day -day care just yet. So we discussed a bit about the technological advances so far. From the patient's perspective, how do you think telemedicine will impact the healthcare experience? Well, one of the things we, we've learned, you know, what happened with COVID was most healthcare systems were dipping their toe in the telemedicine pool. And so at UCSF, I've been an advocate for it. It makes all the sense in the world to me. And I just to show how influential I am. I had managed to move us from 1% of our outpatient visits being telemedicine to 2% over five years. And then in March, 2020, that went from 2% to 70% in a month. So, and that was everybody's experience that telemedicine was clearly ready for prime time in terms of the technology, but what prevented it from happening was doctors had never used it and were skeptical of it. Patients were, had never used it and didn't really understand it. And there were some regulatory and payment barriers to it. All of those barriers went away. Everybody realized if we're going to see patients in the first month of COVID, we better see them through telemedicine. We're not going to see them. And so what happened was patients actually like it better. The data are very clear that that you know patients prefer having a visit with their doctor over telemedicine from you know rather than going to the office and sometimes that's just because it's a hassle and you have to park and pay and wait and all that. Um, where that lands, I think, is anybody's guess. What we've seen is as COVID began to recede. Of, of course, it's unreceding now, but during those months where things kind of chilled out. Uh, most places went from 70% telemedicine back down to 20. And I think that's about where it's going to land. I think for some patients, they really prefer it. For some patients, it's a lifeline. They're out in a rural community and they can't get to a doctor very easily. And this gives them a way of seeing a doctor really almost anywhere, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it, what we're seeing is real segmentation based on the clinical kinds of problems. So for mental health, it's gone, it's probably 90% telemedicine now. If you're a psychiatrist, you're probably going to see most of your patients through telemedicine in the future. For palliative care, you know, people dying at home and we made them come in to see us in a clinic, uh, virtually like 98% of our visits are now through telemedicine. Whereas for things like cardiology and GI, 20, 25%. I think it's great. I mean, I think that it's, you know, we should meet patients where they want to be met. Um, you know, you miss some things doing it through telemedicine the same way you miss some things doing a Zoom meeting versus an in-person meeting. But the benefits of, of convenience, I think, outweigh that for many patients and many, um, and many uh, providers and healthcare systems. Well, the interesting thing from a policy standpoint will be, you know, the Mayo Clinic 30 years ago said, we want to be a national brand. There are very few healthcare national brands, if you think about, you know, the great hospitals there, they, you know, they're Johns Hopkins or UCSF or Stanford or Penn or whatever, you know, they're, they're regional, you know, maybe some rich people get in a plane and fly to go there, but most people get their health care locally. Um, Mayo Clinic said we want to be a national brand. What did they do? They built hospitals in Scottsdale, Arizona and in Jacksonville, Florida and a couple other places. If you were Mayo today and you said we want to be a national brand, you'd probably not build a whole lot of buildings. You would probably emphasize your ability to take see a Mayo doctor through telemedicine. So it's going to change the marketplace the same way, you know, when stores were stores, you had to go to your local bookstore. Now, you know, who knows, who cares that Amazon's in Seattle? Amazon's everywhere. So I think it's going to create sort of a national market in a way that will be very different and really change the nature of how people get care in ways that I think are pretty hard to predict. And just as a last question to wrap our session up, um, as we're nearing our time at eight o'clock, uh, what do you see as like so far we've with, with as a students, we've transitioned to more online uh, based learning, right? In terms of patients, 
how drastically has there been a shift since the beginning of COVID to an online format with telemedicine? Has it kind of pushed patients into that format of telemedicine or has it not made much of a change? Not so much. I mean, you know, my daughter in her second year of med school was basically, she said I was at Zoom University. Basically all of her classes went online and some of that it was fine when they were kind of didactic. It's no different than probably what you guys are doing. And some of it, it was not fine because you really needed to see patients and learn to take care of them and examine them and all that. Now they're all back to in-person and um, she's seeing patients in the office and in the clinic, you know, in the hospital, in the ER. Uh, um, and, you know, to the extent that if she goes and does a psychiatry rotation, she'll probably be doing most of her visits remotely because that's the way they're doing it these days. So it's sort of going to be determined by where patients are getting their care. And we clearly are going to have to teach you how to deliver good telemedicine care. Uh, you know, we'll learn it together because we don't have any idea. We're kind of all figuring this out as we go along. Uh, but, but you know, I, the majority of care in most specialties will continue to be in-person care. And, um, and I think, you know, medical education will sort of follow follow that as you know if that if patients are being cared for remotely then we'll have to teach you how to do that remotely but i think the majority of your training will still be in person all right well i think that wraps, wraps up our session today thank you so much dr bog for your time taking time out of your busy schedule today uh, for our audience listening to receive a certificate for this session you must pass the quiz on our website which is now uploaded be sure to join us next week for our next virtual shadowing session with dr mul hatra on August 25th at 7 p.m. Central. And once again, thank you, Dr. Bob, uh, for your very time. You're welcome. Have a good, good night. Luck. Good luck to all you guys.